So today we are very excited to be joined by Mariah Donahue, who is one of our early career awardees for this semester. Uh, Mariah is a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Kentucky, uh, where she studies in the lab of Dr. David Weisrock. Um, and Mariah is currently in the Madagascar, so it's pretty cool. I think this is the first ever ESS seminar taking place uh, in the Madagascar. Um, so Mariah will be talking about today the significant effects of host dietary guild and phylogeny in wild lemur gut microbiomes. So uh, thank you, Mariah, and welcome. Thank you. I'll uh, share my screen now and make it big. Everyone can see that okay? Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for having me for this. This is my first time ever giving a talk to a department that's not my own. And um, so far, it's been a really fun process. And um, I'm really looking forward to more of it um, later in today and tomorrow. So my research is all about lemurs, their gut microbiomes, and the different factors that shape those microbiomes. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy. But before I can get into all of that, I have to tell you my whole life story, obviously. So I'm from Queens, New York, which is um, an outer borough of New York City. And maybe not surprisingly, I did not grow up with like a great love for nature or anything. I was super into the flute. Uh, I just played flute all day, thought flute was gonna be my whole life. I was gonna be a music teacher or something. And science was my least favorite topic in school. I hated it so much. Um, and then my high school offered this opportunity to, well, it was for any New York City public high school and you could get free college credit um, for any course you wanted by going to a community college on the weekends. And I hated biology the most. So I said, okay, I'll do biology so that I won't have to take that in, you know, a four-year college. Um, and so what really struck me about this and looking back on it, I think was maybe pivotal in my life, even if I didn't know it at the time, was that this lecture started off with evolution and no one had ever explained evolution to me before. And it just like, I don't know, suddenly everything made sense to me. <laughs> like, you know, I felt like biology class was all about, this is how plants made, and this is the parts of the cell. And I just, I didn't know why we cared, like, what did it matter? Why am I learning this? I would just memorize it and not get it. And once I learned about Darwin and evolution, I really got it. And um, so yeah, it turns out that was pivotal. Um, and I made this sort of, I think, unconscious choice to not even declare those credits when I enrolled at um, my undergrad university, which is Stony Brook on Long Island. Um, and it turns out that's actually a pretty good science school. I, I didn't pick it for that reason. I picked it because it was close to home. Um, but, you know, those were two choices that really shaped my entire life. Um, and now I can be here presenting an evolution seminar. So at Stony Brook, I was an anthropology major. Um, and anthropology is a study of human origins, including uh, comparing humans to our closest ancestors, primates. And so there was this very, very cool opportunity at Stony Brook to go to Madagascar and study abroad. And um, I had never left the country before or even really gone on a hike, but just something about this trip just really sounded cool to me. And so I signed up <laughs> the first day I heard about it. And uh, all my friends and family thought I was absolutely crazy. Like it was a cry for help, um, but it wasn't. And I went to Madagascar completely unprepared. I didn't have a raincoat. <laughs> and um, I just like, can't even explain it. I just fall in love with lemurs and field work. I loved everything about it. And um, it's crazy to say it now, but like that was nine years ago. That was in 2013, my sophomore year of college. And um, here I am in 2022, nine years later, uh, broadcasting live from Madagascar. So basically my whole life after study abroad just revolved around studying lemurs and really their gut microbiomes. <laughs> so after doing my undergrad, um, I stayed at Stony Brook University to do a master's degree in ecology and evolution with Dr. Patricia Wright, who is a primatologist who works with lemurs of Madagascar. And 
she was the first one not only to tell me about lemurs in Madagascar, but also about gut microbiomes. Um, we were sitting in her office one day and she said, oh, I keep hearing about this thing called the gut microbiome. Can you do some homework and tell me what it is? And then I came back and I was obsessed with it. Um, so we went ahead and submitted a National Geographic Young Explorers grant, which was funded and allowed me to go to Madagascar and lead my first field expedition, um, where I compared the gut microbiome of a critically endangered lemur species across different um, degrees of habitat disturbance. And that culminated in my first paper. So that was my master's work. And then I shifted gears a little bit for my PhD, but still definitely stayed in the same lane, I would say. Um, so I became really interested in the work of Dr. David Weisrock, um, who had work in microbial diversity, um, but he also had done a ton of work on lemur phylogenetics and speciation, which were topics that were really interesting to me as someone who was getting more and more into evolution. So I applied to join his lab at the University of Kentucky and luckily got in. And in my first year at Kentucky, uh, Dave and I sat down and we sort of devised the project that I'll be talking about today. And it's a really uh, good project, I think, for both of us because it combines, you know, my passion for lemurs and gut microbiomes and his, uh, you know, unparalleled expertise in phylogenies. And so today I'll be presenting this paper that actually just got published. Um, and it's my first chapter of my PhD. Uh, so uh, gut microbiomes are cool for lots of reasons. Um, and they have extremely important evolutionary significance. So I know I don't have to tell this department because you have a ton of very, very cool astrobiologists, but microbes and symbiotic relationships in general are absolutely crucial to the formation of complex life. And it's not like that um, integral relation ever degraded. Um, you know, today most animals could not survive without their microbiomes. They do, they play at least some role in almost everything an organism does right down to, it turns out, neurological processes. You wouldn't believe it, but your gut microbiome is playing a huge role in that. And if you believe in the holobiont theory, which I think makes a lot of sense, you might think that um, an organism is actually not just the organism itself, but everything living in and on the organism and that natural selection acts on a host genome plus all the genomes in and on it. Um, and this is sort of a, theoretical or philosophical belief right now, but um, as more and more research comes out about the uh, importance of the gut microbiome in all host processes and perhaps even their evolution itself, um, this could be sort of a shift in the paradigm in how we think about natural selection and evolution. And so the first step, and we're still, I think, sort of in the infancy of this research, but the first really important step has been figuring out um, just sequencing gut microbiomes across the tree of life. And so the first thing that really stood out in these early studies is that it seems like most species have their own unique gut microbiome. So, you know, there's a chimpanzee microbiome, a dog microbiome, a human microbiome. And of course, there's tons of inter-individual variation within a given species. But for the most part, individuals within one species have more similar gut microbiomes to each other other than they do to individuals outside their species. And so um, we also know that this is not a coincidental or neutral um, product of, you know, neutral evolution. It seems like it's actually really, really important to organismal fitness. And the first really good hint of this came from this really cool type of um, research called reverse transplant studies. And so what they do is they switch and swap the microbiomes of closely related species. And in the graph I show here, they're using Nisonia wasps. And they ask, what happens if we give this species the microbiome of their sister species? And across you know, all the different model organisms they've done this on, there's three results, death, infertility, and illness. So it seems like you really should not uh, try to survive with the microbiome of another species. Um, so when I saw that, that really, I just thought that was an amazing result. And it really made me wonder about how this could happen. Like, how could you evolve your very own microbiome? And how could it be conserved across all these different individuals in a given species? Now, we know that species have their own microbiomes, but there's still a lot we don't know. 
And one of the first questions to pop up in this field was whether or not the gut microbiome actually has phylogenetic signal. And so in gut microbiome research, we call phylogenetic signal phylogenetic. And put very simply, this is just the tendency for more closely related species to share more closely related gut microbiomes. And what this implies is that in the grand scale, evolutionary history is actually much more important than ecology in shaping your gut microbiome. And to demonstrate this, I like to use myself. So I have a dog. Uh, me and him famously don't have a ton of boundaries, except for when I'm here in Madagascar, I guess. I'm not with him right now. But when I'm in Kentucky, we are together a lot. And we definitely cohabitate. He eats, you know, at least a bite of everything I do. And so we're exchanging microbes all day, every day. Um, but of course, he's a dog and I'm a human. And while I haven't done this experiment, I, re I have reason to believe that if I were to sequence the poops of myself, my dog, and my study system, lemurs, I would probably have a microbiome that's more similar to lemurs living in Madagascar, who I never share food with, never let in my house. I'm probably more similar to them than I would be to my dog, simply because I'm more closely related to the lemurs than I am to the dog that lives in my house. And so we wanted to know, or phylosymbiosis people in general want to know, is this true? Is this idea, this pattern, how common is it in nature? Is evolution really more important than ecology in driving the gut microbiome? So <laughs> this sounds, you know, um, you know, simple, easy, but um, of course, in evolution, nothing is a simple pattern. Um, so a few studies came out that said, wow, it looks like there's phallosymbiosis. And then just as fast, studies started to come out that completely rejected the phallosymbiosis hypothesis. The first study to really do this was actually done um, by this research group run by Dulcich. And what they did was they compared the gut microbiomes of different ant-eating mammals. So anteating has evolved independently multiple times across uh, mammals. And so they wanted to know if there was convergent evolution of the gut microbiome in the same vein as there being convergent evolution of their dietary strategies. And what they found was that mammals shared more similar gut microbiomes with each other than they did to species in their own genus and family. So this was the first really big smack of people. Clearly, sometimes diet can override phylogenetic signal. Oh, it says my connection's unstable. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, it seems to be working just fine. Okay, good. It gave me an alert. Okay. Fine. Um, okay, and then the next big uh, deviation from phylogenetics that came out, or another really good example, was in chipmunks. So people looked at the gut microbiomes of chipmunks across North America, and they found that actually geography and habitat were much more important than phylogenetic relationships. Another big bias that has popped up is that phylosymbiosis is much more common in mammals than it is in insects, birds, and fish. And then finally, the last big sort of uh, exception to this rule, the one that makes the least sense, is that what, uh, what happens a lot is that if you look at um, a given place, symbiosis with two different research groups, you often find that um, results differ. Like one will say there is phallosymbiosis, one will say there isn't. And this has happened a lot in primates and it's happened really a lot in lemurs. And so uh, that got me really interested in figuring out why is there this variation? Why can no one really say for sure if lemurs have phallosymbiosis? And so lemurs will be the thing I talk about the rest of uh, this presentation and um, the rest of my life probably. <laughs> uh, but before I can tell you about lemur phallosymbiosis, I'll give you some background about lemurs. So if you don't know, lemurs are primates that are endemic to Madagascar, which is the fourth largest island in the world, if you need some trivia. Um, the lemur ancestor rafted across the Mozambique Channel very bravely, or accidentally, um, to the west coast of Madagascar between 50 and 70 million years ago. And amazingly, when the lemur ancestor got here, they were met with an island that was full of all the food they could ever want, but um, there was absolutely no competition and no predators. So they were able to take over the island and had this extraordinary adaptive radiation, um, which has resulted today in over 100 species of living lemur 
In addition to at least 17 species of lemur that have gone extinct within the last 500 to 1,000 years due to human hunting. And these lemurs were very, very big, some the size of gorillas. And it's very disappointing that they're not around because I would have loved to see their poops. Um, not only do lemurs have extraordinary evolutionary diversity, but their ecological diversity is also pretty much unparalleled. It's pretty cool. So like I said, lemurs got to Madagascar and there was no competition, no predators. So they were able to disperse across the entire island. And if you know Madagascar, you know that there are tons of different habitats. We have rainforests, dry forests, mangroves, and even the Singhi, which is a place I haven't been yet. But basically the Singhi is just the most hostile environment you can think of. It's nothing but tall, sharp rocks. And of course, lemurs live there. Another really cool thing that happens on Madagascar is that in a single even hectare forest, you can have representatives from all five lemur families living in sympatry. And this is due in part to really incredible diversity in their body size, social system, dietary strategies, activity patterns. All of this allows for fine scale niche differentiation, which allows them to live in sympatry. And at the same time, you can have closely related species, even sister species, where one lives in a rainforest and one lives in a dry forest. And so given this really interesting evolutionary and ecological matrix, lemurs were, of course, a very interesting system for initial studies of phyllosymbiosis. Um, however, given, you know, I would say more efforts in lemurs than most systems, um, phyllosymbiosis remains pretty unclear. Now, what we do know for sure is that lemurs definitely have their own species-specific gut microbiome. So they're not like caterpillars, for example, where they don't have resident microbiomes. They definitely do have microbiomes. Plenty of studies have proven this, and they show that, you know, in general, there's a Chifaka microbiome, a brown lemur microbiome, an injury microbiome. Um, but what we don't know is whether they have this pattern of phyllosymbiosis where more closely related species are sharing more similar gut microbiomes. So I believe there are five studies that were designed to test phyllosymbiosis in lemurs, and two found support for phyllosymbiosis, and three said no, diet or ecology are actually more important than evolution in shaping the lemur gut microbiome. So naturally, uh, me and my co-authors co wanted to come in and sort of, you know, try to solve this puzzle or at least shed some light on, you know, why everyone's disagreeing. So our first goal was to test the hypothesis of phyllosymbiosis. Our second goal was to take it one step further and actually quantify the relative importance of evolution, diet, and habitat in shaping the lemur gut microbiome. And we picked these three variables, well, evolution for obvious reasons, but we picked diet and habitat because these are the ecological variables that have been shown across the tree of life to have, to explain the most variation in gut microbiomes of mammals and even insects, birds, other things. Um, at least when you're looking at focusing on host-centered sources of selection. And our final goal was to determine how maybe the choices you make along the pipeline, different analytical choices might actually impact your interpretation of the data and what you say about um, gut microbiome patterning. And so we use this experimental design where we leverage um, these very ecologically and evolutionary diverse communities um, to compare the gut microbiomes of closely related species living in sympatry and allopatry and distant distantly related species living in sympatry and allopatry. Um, and we did this by comparing diverse lemur communities in western dry forests and eastern rainforests. And so here is a figure showing, figure A is um, an abbreviated phylogeny of all living lemurs. And the bolded tips denote species that were sampled in this study. Uh, the squares denote the ecosystem where they were sampled. So red means it was a dry forest, green means it was a rainforest, and yellow means that it was intermediate. And these colors match up with the map on figure B if you want to follow along there too. The symbols next to the squares uh, represent the different feeding strategies of these animals. So we categorize them based on their top foods. And the top foods were leaves, fruits, flowers, insects, tree gum, and bamboo. Um, so as you can see, 
we have pretty good evolutionary diversity in this data set, pretty good habitat diversity, and pretty good dietary diversity. We studied the gut microbiome, you use poops, as I hinted at before. And if you're wondering how you get a poop from a lemur, it's really not that hard. Um, we used two strategies in this research. So for small body lemurs, we set up Sherman traps, just like you would to get, you know, a raccoon out of your attic. And we simply baited the traps with bananas enough to keep them satisfied all night. And then in the morning, we let them go and they pooped all over the cage and we collected the poops. For large bodied uh, lemurs, they would not tolerate that. So um, we had to actually go out, we go for hikes and we just sort of look around for lemurs. And when we find them, we just sort of uh, hang out underneath their butts and wait for them to poop. And um, it's pretty fun. And so we try to get the poops as quickly as we can to avoid contamination from soil microbes, which can be pretty substantial. Um, and yeah, in all that ended up with 172 fecal samples. And so we took those samples back to the lab in Kentucky where we extracted microbial DNA. And we also amplified this metabarcoding region V4 of the 16S rRNA gene, which is a common marker for gut microbiome research. And then the PCR products were sequenced on an aluminum MySeq. And I should say that even though this is a picture of me, um, I got substantial, like really substantial help in this lab work from undergraduates at University of Kentucky who were enrolled in this course called STEM Cats, which is an immersive research course for freshmen. And um, 13 students signed up for our section. And so we sort of used the samples that I collected in Madagascar to train them in these simple lab techniques. Um, and yeah, definitely, it was really cool to work with them and to have them play such a big role in this uh, project. And two of them are actually co-authors. Three of them are co-authors. And then the next big thing we had to do was actually figure out how we were going to quantify diet and um, habitat variables. So it wasn't really feasible for me to go out and actually collect feeding behavior because we just had too many species in this data set and a good feeding behavior study requires a lot of time and effort. So we did literature reviews um, and luckily there were literature reviews available for literally, or there was feeding behavior studies available for every species in our data set. To understand habitat differences, we did ecological niche modeling. Um, so this allows you to compare the preferred habitat conditions of any given species based on their presence and absence localities. And so this figure here shows what the output of an ecological niche model looks like. And so the red spots are places where the leaf or the animal in question is most likely to be found. And so from these red spots, we extracted climate data, and that's what we ended up inputting in our analyses downstream. And now for the fun part, really getting into the weeds of it. So one of the biggest, uh, biggest steps in gut microbiome research is figuring out how are you going to actually describe the gut microbiome? Because what is the description? You have too many options. So most people end up using beta diversity. And if you remember from like community ecology courses and things like that, Beta diversity is very simply the differences in species composition between ecosystems, habitats, or in this case, poop samples. And by species composition, I mean the types of microbes that can be found in these fecal samples. Now, sounds easy enough, but of course it's ecology, so there's tons and tons of options. Um, there's, I don't even know how many types of beta diversity metrics, but there's two types that really stand out in microbiome research. So I'll tell you about what I think is probably the most popular first, even though I haven't actually sat down and quantified this. I just, I see it the most in microbiome papers and that's called unifrac metrics. So unifrac metrics are actually based on the microbial phylogeny that's output from these 16S sequences. And something that I think people don't necessarily know is that unifrac metrics actually are weighted and they weight long internal branches of the microbial phylogeny more significantly than they do the shorter branches. And so in effect, this actually maximizes the importance of older microbial plates. So it's more likely to detect um, shifts in community composition that are related with shifts in older microbial plates 
than it is to detect these differences in younger microbial clays. And as you can imagine, this could really actually bias your results in a major way. So to sort of complement these unifract metrics, I also use star phylogeny metrics. And the two most popular ones are Bray Curtis and Jacquard. And so these beta diversity metrics are actually only based on microbial taxonomy. So basically just, you know, the names of the OTUs. And these do not weight any microbes differently. Everyone's weighted the same, which makes it much easier to detect shifts in community composition that are connected with younger clades. And I'll try to, you know, keep all this fresh as we go on, because I know it's a lot to remember. So the last sort of method Z part is how we actually test phylosymbiosis. And uh, surprise, surprise, um, there's really no consensus on this. So a sort of side goal of the paper was to try and show that there's at least three major ways to do it, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. So the first and by far the most popular is the codendrogram approach, which very simply matches up a phylogeny of the host and um, a dendrogram. So like a tree showing similarity of a trait. Um, in this case, the trait being the gut microbiome. So you just put those two trees together and figure out if the branching order matches. The second most popular, usually used in conjunction with codendrograms, is a very simple Mantel test, which simply asks if gut microbiome distance increases with host phylogenetic distance. And then the third way, which is by far the least popular, but I think by far the most informative, is actually testing for phylogenetic signal using methods that we see in all other different kinds of um, evolutionary traits, like tons of morphology studies, for example, um, we'll use Blomberg's K and Pagel's Lambda. Um, I only know of, I think, maybe four gut microbiome studies that have actually used these. Um, and we were the first to try it in lemurs. And um, yeah, I'm hoping this is the direction that phylosymbiosis research takes, is actually using all three of these methods. And then to address our second um, objective, which was the relative importance of evolution, diet, and habitat, we used um, two methods. So the first is the most common in microbiome research, which is using an Adonis regression or something similar to it, um, which very simply tells you the percent of total uh, trait variation that's explained by your study variables. And here it's diet, habitat, and taxonomy. And I say taxonomy here and not phylogeny because Adonis regressions do not account for phylogeny, um, which again can be a huge problem in gut microbiome research because what do you do if you're looking at the effects of evolution and the effects of an evolutionarily structured trait like diet? Um, you know, most people don't say anything about it, <laughs> but there's a very good solution. And that would be to use phylogenetic generalized least square regressions or PGLS. And so these were designed to measure the effect of different traits um, while taking phylogeny into account. So we compared our results using Adonis regressions and PGLS to see if maybe that would shed some light. And so with that, I will get into the results. So first and foremost, let me change this. Oh, it's too, okay. So first and foremost, we had tons of support for the phallosymbiosis hypothesis from both um, codendrograms and from Mantel tests. So um, in total, we ran 44 tests of codendrograms and all 44 showed um, higher congruence than expected by chance. And here I have an example of a codendrogram on the left-hand side. And as you can see, it's certainly not perfect, right? Like, you know, they don't line up perfectly, but um, it's still more significant than if there was no effect or no similarity between these two dendrograms. Um, we also found using Mantel tests that 42 of 44 tests were significant. So sort of across the board, it seemed like there was phallosymbiosis. And, you know, probably could have stopped there, but we wanted to see um, the effects of phylogenetic signal. So um, that's where things I think got really interesting because we were able to actually uh, sort of partition the microbiome a little bit and get a glimpse into, um, you know, how phylogenetic signal changes as you look deeper and deeper. So in this graph, 
Um, you'll see on the X axis, there are, uh, it's labeled PCO1 through PCO5, and that corresponds to uh, principal coordinate analysis principal coordinate analyses. Um, so basically what we had to do, because you, in order to do Blomberg's K and Pagel's Lambda, you have to actually have um, a number to input, right, like a univariate number. Um, so we ended up reducing the gut microbiome using principal coordinate analyses and then extracting those eigenvalues and inputting those into the model. Um, and so what you should see here is that if you look at the dashed line, that's sort of your bar for whether or not there's phylogenetic signal. And in PCO1 and PCO2, which explain the most variation in the data set, um, there is really strong phylogenetic signal across the board, across metrics and across um, the two different tests. And then the signal definitely degrades um, as you get further from PCO1. Something else that stood out um, was that Bray Curtis and Jacquard, these star phylogeny metrics that don't, uh, they don't use the lemur or the microbial phylogeny, they only use taxonomy. Those were significantly more consistent than Unifrac was. And I'll talk more about that later, but um, I thought that was interesting. So this is sort of how the data looks when you plot it in ordination space. And this is beta diversity. And what should stand out is that there are sort of three pretty good clusters. So the symbols, correspond to the lemur family. Um, and so what you should see is that there's a very clear square cluster. So that's all the lemuridae, a very clear circle cluster, all the chirogalidae, and a very clear triangle cluster, all the injuridae. Now, of course, you're probably also seeing that there's two very obvious deviations. So there's the red squares at the top, those are from ringtail lemurs, and then there's the purple squares sort of overlapping with the triangles, and those belong to prolemur simus or the bamboo lemur. Um, so except for those two, everyone's sort of clustering with their families, and I'll talk more about those two guys later on as well. So the next big result we had was we wanted to look at um, the percent of each trait in the gut microbiome. And so overall taxonomy, especially higher level taxonomy, explain the most variation. So host family and genus accounted each for between 16 and 22%. Whereas species identity was actually the least explanatory variable and it only explained less than 2% using all different beta diversity metrics. And diet is where things got really interesting. So diet explained between 13 and 15% of the variation when you look at unifrac metrics, um, but only 6 to 7% when you're looking at the star phylogeny metrics, Ray Curtis and Jacquard. And as a reminder, unifrac uses the microbial phylogeny, Ray Curtis and Jacquard do not use the microbial phylogeny. And finally, habitat is going to kind of fall out of my discussion here because it never really was that interesting. It only explained between 2 and 6% of the variation and was rarely ever significant. So the big question is what's going on with diet? Um, how come it explains, how come it's so different between Unifrac and Bray Curtis? Um, and the other thing was that diet does have phylogenetic structure. So we wanted to make sure we were accounting for that when we were explaining, when we were looking at whether or not this trait was a factor. So what we found using PGLS was even crazier. So diet was, significant using unifrac metrics, but not using Bray Curtis or Jacquard metrics. And this was consistent across all 44 trials. Um, so that blew my mind. <laughs> and so I think there are some good reasons for all of these very interesting results. And I think this actually can illuminate why the lemur phallosymbiosis pattern has been so hard to disentangle. So first and foremost, I think our big result is that Lemurs have phyllosymbiosis. It's uh, all tests supported it. Um, you know, I think it's pretty well justified. Um, however, you know, it, the story doesn't stop there because I think it's also important to talk about where this fits into the current lemur phyllosymbiosis debate. And I only call it a debate for fun. It's really a good natured. Uh, back and forth between uh, people I know well. Um, and yeah, so basically, 
um, from my study and sort of our collective mind in talking about this, it seems like there are three really good reasons for these contradictions. Um, so first, our studies differ in taxonomic filling breath, so how many species were actually included. We used very different analytical methods and we also used different species. And so I think this is actually a really important factor. Um, there are idiosyncratic patterns in certain clades that make it so that in some cases they have these really strong ecological effects, maybe because of adaptation, um, whereas others are more evolving more neutrally with this phylogenetic signal. Another thing that cropped up is that it looks like patterns of discordance between the host phylogeny and the gut microbiome dendrogram. Um, the discordance really increased at these shallower levels of evolutionary divergence, meaning that, um, you know, very clear partitioning between families and genera, but they became very overlapping among species. And so what that means is if you were to test phallosymbiosis using, for example, just one family or just one genus, you're much less likely to find phallosymbiosis than if you actually had a data set that included multiple different families. Um, so it seems like if you're zooming in on a particular clade, um, it's more likely that ecology will override evolution. And there are good reasons for that. And before I get into those reasons, um, or maybe this is sort of complementary to those reasons, so the strength of phallosymbiosis is definitely different among different lemur clades. And the signal was really, really strong in Indridae. So here we have the three species of Indridae that I used in my uh, data set. So we have Avahi on the left-hand side and then two Propithecus species. One lives in the dry forest and one lives in the rainforest. And the rainforest one is sympatric with Avahi. So what we found was that allopatric Pathicus species had more similar microbiomes than either did with Avahi. So this makes a lot of sense though, because Propithecus had, or Indridae has much deeper divergence times than for example, Lemuridae or Chirogilidae. And they also have much less niche competition and niche overlap. So Avahi is small bodied, mostly just eats leaves and is pretty nocturnal. Although I did get this picture of one sort of going to bed during the day. So that was a special day. Um, whereas Shifakis, Propithecus, um, have much more varied diets and they're very strictly diurnal and they are much bigger than Avahi. So it sort of makes sense that ecology wouldn't have uh, overridden the effects of evolution here. Now, <laughs> phylosymbiosis was by far the weakest in Lemuridae. Um, so I'll talk about two examples here. So probably the craziest result was how different the ringtail lemur and bamboo lemur microbiomes were to anyone else in their family and to each other. Um, so based on phylogenetic relationships, they should have had the most similar gut microbiomes to one another, but they were completely different from each other and clustered nowhere near their families. And one of, I understand it with bamboo lemurs. So if you don't know about bamboo lemurs, um, they have adapted this insane diet where all they do is eat bamboo all day. And the bamboo is jam packed with cyanide, enough cyanide to kill an adult human four times over every single day. That's what they eat. And they are these small lemurs, never more than probably 15 pounds. Um, so obviously that requires um, a pretty extraordinary uh, physiology, and I'm sure the microbiome plays a role in that, although it hasn't been tested or proven, so that could be a cool potential project down the line. So I wasn't surprised to see that bamboo lemurs had such different microbiomes. I was surprised to see that ringtail lemurs did, because nothing to me really stands out to, about them that would make them be so different. They do have some differences though, so they have much larger group sizes than any other lemur, they're also much more terrestrial. They spend most of their time on the ground. Um, they have much stricter dominance hierarchy, so they could be more stressed out. Um, and they have very general diets. They probably eat more animal matter than any other lemur. But honestly, um, this is a mystery. And I think, again, this is something that should be studied more down the line. 
Another really interesting deviation in lemuridae came from the brown lemur genus, so you lemur. And so this result I thought was really remarkable. So I had um, three species, you lemur rupee fronds, Eulema ruberventer, which is Dimpatric with rupee fronds. And then I had a population of hybrids that was allopatric from these other two brown lemurs. However, these hybrids are hybrids of rupee fronds and another species that unfortunately was not included in this study. But because these hybrids literally have rupee fronds DNA in them, I was sure that they were going to have more similar gut microbiomes to rupee fronds than rupee fronds would to ruberventer. But surprise, surprise, uh, rupee fronds and ruperventer had very similar gut microbiomes and they were very different from hybrids. Um, so this points to uh, perhaps ecological adaptation as well. The next big thing we found, because of these differences in results between beta diversity metrics, it actually seems like there's some evidence that phallosymbiosis is stronger in younger microbial clades. So if you remember, breakers and jacquard amplify the effects of young microbial clades, and not, maybe not surprisingly, they have the strongest phallosymbiosis signal. And so what I think this probably means is that as lemurs radiated, so did their gut microbiome. And so many of the microbes that are species specific, of course, arose during that diversification process, and they're going to be much younger than, say, older clades that might be associated with diet. So I think that, let me see here. So it looks like because diet was only ever really significant using unifrac metrics, which weight these long internal branches, um, that's pretty good evidence that dietary microbes are actually much older. And they actually serve to sort of homogenize the lemur gut microbiome as these microbes were probably acquired before major diversifications within these lemur clades. Um, so I thought this was really interesting and did sort of explain why there's disagreement among these different papers. Maybe if they had leveraged all these different beta diversity metrics, the same patterns would have arisen. And so I think that's a very cool potential future direction down the line. And so I think there's a few major implications from our study. And the first is that natural selection seems to be conserving these species-specific gut microbiomes, and it's happening over these deep evolutionary timescales. And it also seems like gut microbiomes are partitioned, and that you know some members of the community are a reflection of host ecology, and others, and perhaps it's a greater proportion, actually reflect, reflect evolution and speciation. It also looks like extreme ecological adaptations like cyanide metabolism, for example, are associated with these major deviations from phyllosymbiosis. And shared ecology, especially among closely related species, can actually serve to homogenize the gut microbiome and make their gut microbiomes more similar than expected due to phylogenetic signal. And so that's sort of the conclusion of that part of the talk. And now I'll very briefly talk about what I'm doing in Madagascar now. Um, so as you can imagine, I had a lot of questions that popped up after this phallosymbiosis study. And one question that really haunted me was just sort of like, how does it happen? And why does it happen? So I wanted to look at the timing, the causes, and consequences of gut microbiome divergence. And I thought a really cool way to do that was by using closely related but ecologically divergent species, sort of taking this microevolutionary approach. So I was very haunted by the hybrid zone with the brown lemurs. And so that's what I'm doing here right now. I'm looking at um, gut microbiome and speciation dynamics in the brown lemurs. So I'm comparing the parental species, Eulema rufi fronds and cinereaceps, with their hybrids. Um, and uh, it's pretty, it's a lot of really crazy field work. And um, I'm really, really excited to find out, you know, what's going on with them. And yeah, hopefully that'll lead to some very interesting results that might actually illuminate the role of the gut microbiome and speciation in general. And I feel I would be doing my study system a disservice if I didn't conclude the talk by telling you a little bit about their plight and small things that you can do to help them. 
So like all primates, um, the major threats to lemurs are deforestation, bushmeat hunting, and the pet trade. Uh, these things are not uh, the result of bad people. They're the result of a very oppressive system and a history of colonization. Um, so Madagascar is unfortunately one of the most economically poor and food insecure countries in the entire world consistently on that top five list that you don't want to be on. And there's also a pretty uncontrolled human population growth, which is also exacerbating um, not only environmental pressures, but economic and health pressures here on the island too. And, you know, we know there are, at least in theory, some good solutions to these problems, although they're very, very hard to actually um, enact because it's a very complicated system. But we know that by having more sustainable agriculture, um, and by solving or reversing some of the deforestation that's already happened, um, we can certainly help conserve the environment and maybe even expand it to, you know, a fraction of what it once was. And then also education is very important. So education rates are extremely low in Madagascar, not just conservation education, but education in general. And that has been known, especially for women to be a really important factor in um, things like family planning. So major efforts to increase education, especially in these rural villages, um, is also key. It's a key tool in, um, the, in the efforts to sort of conserve Madagascar and make it better for both the biodiversity here and the people here. Um, of course, these are like very big issues, right? And so there's not so much that a single person can do, but there are small things that you can do to help. And of course, the first thing when you're talking conservation is always money, unfortunately. Um, but you know, if you have five dollars, you might want to throw them to some conservation NGOs that are based in Madagascar. If you know, I convince you that lemurs are, you know, good animals. <laughs> um, so there are tons of really cool NGOs in Madagascar. I'm affiliated with two: Center Val Bio, which is committed, um, you know, conservation in this one particular region of Madagascar called Ranamathana. Um, and they do really good work. They employ an entire village, basically, um, and they've been here for 30 years. And then Health and Harmony works in another site called Manumbu, and they're very committed to this One Health approach, which is sort of merging um, human health, um, human food security, and reforestation to try and guess what they can do for this one small fragment containing eight species of lemur. Okay, but I know we're all like grad students here. So like, you know, don't have tons of money to give away, not until we're rich, of course, but um, a non-monetary thing you can obviously do. And this is maybe a surprise, but you shouldn't like or share any videos that feature primates being like cute little pets. Um, unfortunately, I get sent these a ton. I'm like, yes, of course they're cute, but it's becoming increasingly clear. There's actually a connection between uh, the popularity of these videos and people seeking out primates as pets. Um, so, you know, a small thing you can do is just not engage with that on the internet. And if you're me, maybe even tell people, hey, you shouldn't be sharing those. It's bad for the cute animal. Another more fun thing you can do is visit AZA, crew, AZA accredited zoos um, because most of them have conservation programs in the host countries of their animals. And finally, and I just learned this one, but if you switch from your search engine from Google Chrome or Safari to Ecosia, you can actually, um, that helps fund reforestation efforts across the global south. Um, so it seems to work just as well as Google Chrome and Safari. And so if you're open to it and haven't done it already, I would say switch to Ecosia because you can sort of search the internet while also sort of uh, helping save rainforests. And so, of course, there's tons of people to acknowledge. First and foremost, my PhD advisor um, and my department at the University of Kentucky. Uh, really just an incredible department. I uh, cannot say enough good things about it. And I would never want to give the impression I did this study alone. I have tons of co-authors, and you can see their names and all about them if you click the DOI there. I have a very good committee that was very important. Um, in pretty much every step of this process. So Dr. Catherine Lennon, Jeremy Van Cleve, Luke Moe, and Tom Gillespie um, got some funding for this. So shout out to the funders. And then 
um, Center of El Bio and MySet were really important resources for me doing uh, field work here in Madagascar. Um, and then of course we had to get all the permissions from the Madagascar National Parks and the government. Um, all the local guides, cooks and porters made the field work possible. My parents were watching my dog and obviously the lemurs. And so thank you so much for listening to this talk. And um, if you wanna talk to me about lemurs, there's my email. And of course, you know, I'm a modern scientist, so I've got the socials. And um, that's all I have to say, so thank you.